Rutgers, 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 Rutgers. Okay, come on. You can do this. You can do this. Hello. My name is Benjamin Doyce, but... <laughs> Hello, this is Benjamin Boyce. Today's guest is Lee Jessam, who is known as Psych Rabble on Twitter and is the author of the Rabble Rouser blog at psychologytoday.com. He is a professor of social psychology at Rutgers University, and he has been leading the charge for a number of years in the reformation of the social sciences. In this interview, we speak about the need for a truly heterodox academy and how difficult that is because everybody is plagued with bias. We talk about the biases in social sciences. We talk about diversity and inclusion and social justice and how those great ideas have a hard time meeting the road of truth and actual action and actually not break off into factions of us liberals hating the conservatives or those conservatives hating us liberals. We talk about a host of other things. He has a lot of passion that he bears into this discussion. So let's just jump right in. This is Lee Jessam. All right, Professor, thanks for your time. Yep, glad to do it. Very excited to speak with you. Um, I love your presence online. Uh, <laughs> You, you have the, the uh, wonderful intersection of facts and passion. It's like... <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much as me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, it's I, like I've been controversial my whole career, and as is my Twitter presence. Like some people love it, some people really hate it, you know, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that you're going after now, well, maybe this isn't a big deal for you, um, but I would like to talk about the Academy in general and talk about your discipline in particular, the social sciences or social yeah. science. Sure. Yeah, but, absolutely. But one thing you've been tweeting about the last few days, and I think we should open with this is um, a diversity statement. Uh, right. And because colleges are now more and more uh, requiring a diversity statement. Um, they are. For entry to even get considered to be hired. Right. Well, and I was surprised to learn, really, as a, as a result of that tweeting the last few days, that, that some are actually requiring them for promotion as well, oh, for wow. ten promotion. Yeah, that was news to me. I did not know that. And it's like, oh, my God, it's really spreading like so many of these other things. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in a weird sense, um, my alma mater, Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington, um, they are uh, basically the avant-garde of everything progressive um, in the academy. And it was actually Brett Weinstein um, making an argument against having a racially uh, centered equity statement as a part of a yearly self-reflection him saying, let's hold on, let's think about this, is what kind of started the ball rolling with getting him in trouble with his uh, colleagues. Oh, that's interesting. I did not know that that was the beginning of this, of, of his his experience. I mean, I knew about the whole, you know, sort of protest and how they were driven out, but I didn't realize that that, that experience predated all that. Yeah, that was about, actually, ironically enough, a year to the day that he stood up in a faculty meeting. I, I finally got the audio of this and kind of made a very uh, sound argument about why this would be a bad idea. A year yeah. to the day is when the students showed up on his doorstep protest. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah, that is that's interesting. I, you know, I mean, it's that all sounds about right, though. So, what do you think is the problem with having a diversity uh, statement or a statement of? Uh, your intention to be diverse. Doesn't that sound like a good idea that you want to promote diversity and <laughs> be fair to all these marginalized uh, people? Right. So to me, there are a couple of problems with it. And that is, even though I not only endorse the, so, so it's hard to even talk about this these diversity statements, because diversity in the context of these statements doesn't mean the normal English version of the word diversity. So in English, I mean, I, you know, I'm going to pull it up right on my computer right now. I'm going to look up diversity and see the definition that comes up. So the definition of diversity, the state of being diverse, variety, 
there was considerable diversity in the style of the reports, a range of different things. Newspapers were obliged to allow a diversity of views to be printed. So that's what diversity means, mm -hmm. like in normal English. But when used on campuses, that is not usually what it means. Usually what it means is what it refers to is a subset of types of diversity. Mm -hmm. So hmm. it, it, it means... So there's an implicit bias within the definition. I, I do believe that implicit biases are real. I, I believe that the ways they have been studied have issues, but nonetheless, I believe even implicit racial biases probably do exist, even though they're weaker than they're cracked up to be. Hmm. I think the, the, uh, the near obsession with uh, race and sort of um, other marginalized groups with implicit bias has missed a million ways that implicit biases really work. Hmm. And one of them is, is this kind of way. That exactly this, that the, the use of the term diversity is quite specific and different in an academic sort of social justice context mm -hmm. because it's just narrower. It refers to a specific set of what sometimes are referred to as marginally, you know, uh, marginal or historically excluded groups. Mm -hmm. And that's fine, actually. It's more than fine. I actually would agree that the um, there is value and importance to universities, especially, doing things to be sure that they hmm. both acknowledge the ways in which such groups have had unnecessary obstacles thrown in their paths and to do what they can to remove those obstacles. That's fine. Like That's fine and necessary. And I am glad that people do that. But the, but, but the use of the term diversity to refer to that is a bit of a bait, bait and switch mm -hmm. because The term means lots of things besides oppressed minorities. Such as diversity of viewpoint Diver or diversity of style of teaching. It's everything. It's Yes, it's diversity of viewpoint. It's diversity of background. It's diversity of experience. It's diversity in social class. It's diversity in nationality. I mean, diversity is like, you know, what it, what what is not included in diversity? But it's but but this vast array of things that are actually diversity is not what is referred to when universities use the term diversity or nor is it what they are referring to when they require diversity statements yeah I, so that that's the uh i'm, I'm looking to see if I, I had it up on my computer for other reasons entirely uh but i had I'm going to get rid of that. Sorry, I can't do that right now. Um, but uh, I had Berkeley's mm. Oh, yeah. I, I saw that too. Up, and they make it really super clear that they're not interested in diversity of, uh, of sort of nationality or ideas. They're interested in diversity referring to these sort of historically marginalized groups and you know they talk about race or gender they're quite explicit about all that um, so but i'm not i'm not calling it up i'm not finding it right now so so in your experience um 
and this is something that I've dealt with a lot, um, both going to Evergreen, studying Evergreen, and then going the larger academic conversation, and even the, the larger socio-political conversation, is that there is this social justice um, group of ideas and values that on the surface of it are so noble and, and righteous and self-evidently good that it's really hard to, um, to criticize them or to, you know, even be wary of them. And, but time and time again, once you look under that surface, there's this, there's a whole bunch of problems. There's a large problem with the outcome and how these ideas are implemented. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have seen over your time, during your time in academia, if you've seen a consistent pattern of these noble ideas being trotted out that come to a, a bad conclusion or that have a, a problematic aim. And what is the difference and where's the, where's the difficulty? Is it like a sheep and uh, wolf in sheep's clothing kind of thing? Do people really believe that this stuff is good or are there people that are hiding behind this to gain power? How skeptical of you are? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, it, to some extent, it's all of those things, right? I mean, academia is not one thing, right? It's like uh. thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands and probably million worldwide. It's probably millions and millions of people, right? Yeah. So you, you and, and in those millions, you will get a diversity of, of views about all this, right? <laughs> you, you know, there's, the, I mean, I'm most familiar with, with, the academy in the United States. I'm a little bit familiar okay. with it in other Western countries. I don't know much about the Nigerian Academy or the Mongolian Academy. I just don't, I don't know what life is like there. But, but in the US, there are a small number of outright conservatives still left in the academy. They're few and far between. For all I know, they hate this stuff and there's just so few, no one knows what their views are on it. Um, uh, um, but there might be some you know, just straight up opponents to it. There are there are obviously like true believers who believe, you know, I mean, there have been a number of sort of essays over the last, I don't know, five years or so compa comparing um, social justice activism to like a religious movement. Mm -hmm, and there yeah. are elements of that. There are true believers and, you know, and, and if you disagree with them, you're an apostate and a blasphemer. So, you're, you're, you know, and I, but I think they believe it. I mean, I, I, I don't think they're not sincere in their beliefs. And then I think you have a lot of people who basically endorse the goals, but not the intolerance. And a lot of people who just want to do their jobs, but are mm. kind of like intimidated into not speaking up because the because of a small number of you know, really sort of intensely hostile um, intimidation incidents. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they know they're at, they don't know that that would happen to them. Nobody could possibly know that. But why risk it if you don't have to? So, and I think that describes, so you have that whole range. It's yeah. really, you know, this big, big range with a fair, because the American Academy on average is so far left, the, the radical minority is much larger in the academy than pretty much anywhere else in the country. Mm. And so they're loud and they're active and they're activist. And there are plenty of activists who are not actually intolerant, but there are also plenty who are. Mm -hmm. And it's disproportionate. It, it, it's, the, their effect is disproportionate because their numbers are disproportionate and because their activism is occasionally intolerant and therefore its effects are, are disproportionate. So yeah. that, I mean, that's my, my, my view of all that. And a while ago you took a stance and this is where your Twitter handle comes from. Uh, psych rabble that you're a rabble rouser within uh, psychology. <laughs> um, and so I'm sure you don't just rabble, uh, rouse the rabble against the far left, but it seems like within the Academy, because that is overrepresented, that might be what you end up, um, calling out the most, or even in right, your right, field. right. So, so my th that's exactly right. My main interest is really the quality of the scholarship. That really, you know, politics. Vote for whoever you want. You know, protest in the streets however much you want. I mean, that's like that's not my place to tell you. You know, whether you should want higher or lower. I mean, as a citizen, I can advocate anything I want as well as anybody else. But mostly. 
I, I am, my presence on both the blogosphere and Twitter is as an academic. I mean, that's how I see most of what I do. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just in that role, it's not my place to tell anybody what policies to support or what parties they should support or oppose. So, okay. But it, but, um, it very much is central to my professional life to improve the quality, you know, in, in sort of expanding circles. You know, I'm a social psychologist, so it's particularly important to me to improve the quality of social psychology. By extension, it's also important to me to improve the quality of psychology. By extension, it's also important uh, to me to improve the quality of the social sciences and by extension to the academy writ large. So that, that all feels like fair game. Okay. On the, the issue of the scientific, so you may have heard the psychology having been described as having a replication crisis, as I, that has come across. Okay, right. So this is, even the replication crisis is controversial. So in the sense that it's not politically controversial in the, in like a partisan ideological sense, but it's controversial in that some people believe it's more serious than others. And they get into like nasty sort of arguments about this. Um, and so that becomes heated on its own. But over and above replicability, my view is that a number of the sort of validity failures mm -hmm. in psychology have nothing to do with replication. Mm -hmm. They have to do with interpretation of studies, in, in the processes by which findings become canonical, you know, oh. become like entrenched in the sort of huh. lore of what psychology is and has shown. And, and those issues, the interpretations and the processes by which some finding becomes like part of the canon, in my view, are riddled with political biases. Mm, mm -hmm. And because at the level of people, my, just individuals, my understanding of the literature is that biased interpretations of evidence is more or less symmetrical on the left and the right. People on the left are no more likely to be dogmatic or insensitive or distorted in their perceptions of evidence than are people on the right. People on the right are also biased and distorted and cherry pick their evidence. But in, in academia, in social psychology, in psychology, in academia writ large, there are so few people on the right that the biases of people on the right minimally, if at all, influence the scientific canon. The, the hypothesization, the theories, then the interpretation, and then right, what is eventually right. enshrined. That's right. And, and in, look, in some fields, this is not going to, in physics, this is not going to matter, right? In engineering, it's, for the most part, not going to matter. And in large parts of psychology, it's not going to matter either. Where it is going to matter is in topics that either are, are or can be politicized. Mm -hmm. That's where it's going to matter. Mm -hmm. And in the social sciences, Lots of topics are politicized. So that's where, you know, so, so because as I see it, the, the almost exclusive, it's not completely exclusive, but the near exclusive source of biases are in, in science, forget not at the individual personal level, but in the science are from the left, most of what I will be rabble rousing about are biases on the left. Yeah. So, yes, that, that was my sort of long way of coming around to yeah. actually answer the original question. Well, yeah. is it simplistic? Uh, is the solution, um, is, would the solution be too simplistic to say that what we need to do is take the right and the left and mash them together in, into some sort of like patchwork centrism? Or do we just, <laughs> do we get away, it, can we ever escape bias enough to become or approach an objective way of hypothesizing and interpreting interpreting data so I I don't see the goal from a science standpoint the goal is truth 
right? However imperfectly we can get at it, and you know, hmm. that, that's a whole discussion itself. That's to me, that's what the purpose of science and social science is. It's to get at things that are actually true. Yeah. Once you have things that are actually true, that are really, really well established as true, bringing that into the real world and changing the world is actually a very reasonable thing to do. So mm. uh, if, if you know that, that if you develop a new way to build a bridge that is less expensive and allows the bridge to be safer and last longer, yeah, you should tell the world about that. But mm. often it works the other way that someone believes they have an answer to a social problem, they think they know what the social problem is, they don't really have clear evidence that that's actually true, and then that drives, it creates sort of agenda-driven research as opposed to a research-driven agenda. I'm, yeah. I'm completely good with you establish the science and then bring it out into the real world. So, so you're, you're championing a measure twice, activist once sort of... Yeah, it's more like measure like 20 or 30 times activist once. Yeah, no, that, yes, that's right. Because especially in the social sciences, there's so much, there, there's so many imperfections in our methods that in my view, we need way more uncertainty. We need to, uh, um, in my ideal academic world, Academics would acknowledge much higher levels of uncertainty in their findings and therefore their conclusions than is currently the norm. Mm -hmm. If you accept that, then, yeah, it's measured 20, 30 times before you actually bring this stuff out into the world. Because you can't really believe the first three or five or eight times that you measure. You, you know, each time maybe you have a little increment in the confidence of, that you have in some conclusion. But it really takes a lot to really, really nail something down in the social sciences. And that, to me, is why it's not that you need liberals and conservatives in order to meet at the center. But on average, liberals are gonna be far more skeptical of any research produced with an obvious conservative, not even you know bent, just like conclusion. Yeah, conclusion, yeah. Right, and conservatives are gonna be highly skeptical of virtually anything that seems to endorse a liberal conclusion. That skepticism, that clash of skepticism I think is an invaluable ingredient towards reaching the truth because okay. it kind of says, no, we can't believe you. Now, if you're a scientist, if I say I can't believe you, you do some study, you have some finding, it then behooves me to say what it would take to believe you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you produce that, I'm kind of, I mean, I always have the right to change my mind. And, you know, the more you think about something, well, maybe I realize, you know what, I did lay it out then, but really, I wasn't completely right. But in general, it kind of behooves me, if you then produce the goods that I told you you needed to provi provide for me to believe you, it kind of behooves me to believe you at that point, mm -hmm. or at least to act as if what you have produced is now something that's actually true. Now, it's always possible that someone else would come along and say, no, you missed all this other stuff. It turns out that it's not true. That's fine. Hmm. That is fine and healthy. But, at, you know, at some point, if research is um, subject to intense skeptical scrutiny and it keeps passing the bar, the conclusion, in my view, is most likely to be on a much more solid ground than if it hasn't been subject to that scrutiny. Yeah, and a certain form of certainty um, and even charisma and ego uh, kind of uh, affords a blind spot for one's biases. Oh, I, and that's true for all of us, which yeah. is why you need the clash of views out there. Okay. So with that as a given, tentatively, uh, what is it about the structure of academia uh, and how these ideas are generated and then come into canonization that actually um, even foster a certainty, which then goes on to allow for biases to perpetuate in, in the data? Do you think it's a structural problem with the way that these papers are produced? And so, yeah, yeah the, the, in 
psychology, which is what I know best. Starting around 2011, 2012, um, there was a sort of embryonic science reform movement born to address these issues. And that movement has is probably still a minority movement, but has made tremendous strides towards accomplishing exactly what you just described, getting the field, creating new norms where people acknowledge, are, are more likely to acknowledge their own potential for all sorts of biases, which are not restricted to political biases. There's like theoretical biases, there's status biases, there's this sort of personal ego self-serving. I mean, there's this whole range of biases way beyond political biases. It's so diverse. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yes, the nature of potential for bias is vastly diverse. That's absolutely true. So that movement, I believe, is not complete, but is changing those norms. So, so in some ways, your question is an older question, right? But now this older vision of what the field was is also implicit, but it's kind of like I run an ex experiment, I do some statistics. If I get P less than 0.05, I've established a fact. And, it, and if you challenge, you know, who are you to tell me, I just did an experiment. I have P less than 0.05. Who are you to say this is not true? You don't have any data. So you had, what I mean, all these criticisms are subject to abuse. But in my view, you had this sort of scientism thing going on, right? There were these sort of, for, you know, forms of science. You run an experiment, you have statistics, and therefore you've established a fact. And that, that created this sort mm. of scientific arrogance about the validity of the research. Yeah. And so in a way, was that the, one of the problems with doing that is that you're reducing truth to one metric, this P point uh, less than or greater than 0 0.05. Like, like having that one line allows for all this blind blindness. It makes me think of that cartoon about airport security where everybody has to go through the security and the terrorist just walks around it. So the bias, <laughs> <laughs> you made this gate, but the bias just walks right around it. <laughs> well, so that's, yeah, that, that's in the mix. The norms prior to the science reform movement and still, it, this is probably still dominant, but I think it's shrinking. So, but certainly prior to the science reform movement, psychologists in general, but, but, I, and I, but I think social psychologists were particularly subject to this, had so many ways to essentially subvert scientific validity on their way to P less than 0.05, that m much of the canon's validity is unclear. So for example, oh, wow. when I say ways to subvert the validity, and in one common practice was to run a zillion studies and only report the ones that are P less than 0.05. So, if you do that, you, I mean, you have a study, you have a P less than 0.05. That's the only thing that makes it into the scientific literature. It looks like you actually found something that's credible. But in order to get that P less than 0.05, you had to run 10 other studies that didn't do it, which means the, the P value, which P stands for probability. So oh, the probability oh, is you. less than 5%. But if you had to run 10 other studies that didn't get it, the overall probability is, is way higher than 5%. You know, it's like it's 50-50 whether you actually found something. So that's just one example. Is, I, is part of the uh, science reform movement that you're describing, does it try to incentivize humility or incentivize complexity or disincentivize... Um, a certain form of certainty? Yeah, so it, it, it has tried to change the incentives. It has changed some incentives. So some journals now have badges, 
which sounds like a really mild thing, but they're sort of like good housekeeping seal of approval badges. Yeah, like the kosher thing on the. On yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. And so, if your data is open, that is, there, you know, uh, so one of the problem, one of the many dysfunctions, was that um, researchers would conduct the studies and no one could verify their results because they never made their data available. Okay. So one change was to try and change the norms and make it more common for people to make their data publicly available. That is absolutely in process. Way more papers have open data now, but you would get a badge for that. Um, hmm. You would also get a badge. So, so a, yet another problem is that researchers would make stuff up after the fact. So I would have some hypothesis, right? And I would run my study and the hypothesis would not be confirmed. But if I fished around enough, I'd get a P less than 0.05 somewhere. And so then I would tell a story around that result. But, but I wouldn't just, but, and sometimes that's okay, doing exploratory research as part of science. Yeah. The, the problem would be, I wouldn't say that's what I did. I would recreate a new hypothesis and act and write this paper up as if I tested it all a priori and, and confirmed the hypothesis. So one problem that I see with that is that you're denying people the ability to watch you grow, like because you're like, you know, cribbing in certainty the whole time. Well, and then, that then is you don't see the thought process of having it's a dialogue worse. with the, it's way worse you know. than that, because if let's say I have 10 outcome variables and I'm predicting my results should be on the first three and I get nothing there, but I get something on the other two, on two of the other eight, seven. Now I craft a new story, right? So it looks like I, but, and I don't say anything about the 10 variables. I only report the two that I have P less than 0.05 on. I'm essentially capitalizing on chance. It, so it, this would be, a good metaphor would be, if I flipped the coin three times, saw how it came out, and then wrote a paper saying that I predicted the three outcomes, therefore I have ESP. <laughs> And and so how does how does that go on to corrupt once that like starts to be replicated or re, uh, that that behavior is replicated itself across yes. the whole discipline? What what right. does end up happening to the structure of the discipline? Right. Well, so the, so you're, you're capitalizing on chance, right? You're making stuff up. You're, you have theories that are in the literature that are essentially predicting outcomes of coin flips after you've seen the coin flip. So the person doesn't have ESP and the theories don't have validity. That's how it corrupts the science. Hmm. The, the literature, may, no one knows how much, but may be filled with bogus theories, con, hmm. you know, post hoc concocted theories. And one of the reasons we know this is actually one of the other badges. So one of the other badges is for what's called pre-registering a study. So when you pre-register a study, you create a document saying in advance what you are going to do. Then when you write up the paper, you link to that pre-registered document so that the world can distinguish between your true a priori hypothesis testing and the exploratory analyses. Mm -hmm. When So there's been a dramatic rise in the number of pre-registered studies, which more often than not, it's more than half the time, if they're a replication attempt, have failed to replicate the original study. Mm -hmm. So when, right, if, if I'm making stuff up after the fact, right, if I'm predicting, if I'm claiming to have predicted the coin flip only because I've already seen the coin flip, I don't have ESP. If I'm forced to predict, up, really predict the outcome of a coin flip and I don't have ESP, I'm going to fail. I'm going to get it right half the time, which is what anybody would get just by chance. Yeah. That seems to be what's going on with much of the research. Not all of the research, but a lot of the research. When people pre-register pre replication attempts, about, about or possibly even more than half the time, they do not replicate the original. Does that um, cause people to, or do you think that in the future as these, uh, as the data and this pre-registering kind of just takes hold and becomes standard, will that start to shape the ways in which uh, scientists um, 
develop the capacity to create a hypothesis and and to uh, to to start to shape the interpretation and, and that generation of, of ideas? It's probably, actually. I mean, it, it probably what that will, well, I, I think the more important thing is that what it will eventually do is produce a more valid literature. Okay. Right, yeah. because, because it'll distinguish between, you know, post hoc versus genuinely a priori confirmed stuff. So if there is some finding that really, you know, is confirmed in 18 out of 20 replications for social science data, I'm going to believe that finding at that point. You know, and you have a certain amount of measurement error and imperfection, it doesn't actually have to confirm it all 20 times. But if you're, you have 18 out of 20 or 19 out of 20 successful replications, that is a lot of success. So pre, because pre-registration allows you to be confident that there really was an a priori test of the hypothesis, it will. Ult- I, I am pretty confident that it will ultimately produce a, liter- a much more solid literature than we currently have. But your question was, will it shape the hypothesizing? That was yeah. your question, and I think it probably will because over the last 30, 40 years, one dysfunction has been researchers in my opinion, overvaluing sort of cute counterintuitive hypotheses. Mm -hmm. So, so, and the idea here is that, you know, man bites dog is more interesting than dog bites man. Yeah. If it's some cute, unexpected sort of, you know, this is why implicit biases took off. One of the earliest versions of this was cognitive dissonance. So cognitive dissonance is, um, has many predictions. Among the predictions is the more you're paid for something, the less you're going to like it. Hmm. Right. And the idea is you say, to your, you say to yourself some version of, well, you know, if you're not paid for it, why are you doing it? Well, you must like it because you're not being paid for it. If you're being paid to do it, well, why, why are you doing it? Well, it's because you're paid. It's not because you really like it. So it's a counterintuitive prediction. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's what I mean. But those kinds of sort of subtle. Are you saying that's true, or are you saying that that was something that was thought to be true and then was proven to not to be true? Cognitive dissonance was one of psychology's first replication crises. Oh. I think it, it it there is probably a reality there, but that's not well understood. Um, I, another recent Twitter conversation I had with people who are part of the science reform movement are like, we really should replicate some of these old cognitive dissonance studies because it's really not clear. All of us are sort of, yeah, they're probably, cognitive dissonance probably really is a thing, but we can't believe the literature. So we, sort of the next step would be to figure out which manifestations really are credible and which aren't. Mm-hmm. So being a social psychologist and then being very active on social media probably gives you some kind of interesting insight on how to apply your knowledge of social science into like being social in in the media. Have you thought about that? And have you thought about like, let's just say uh, how people act on Twitter and like how the how the public discourse is shaped by a platform like Twitter? Is that even interesting to you? So sort of. I'm like, there are people who study Um, social media and its effects. So I actually just came back. I was Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I was uh, um, at a conference on moral grandstanding. Hmm. And what moral grandstanding, so this was a, um, an early version or a pre-final version of a book was on this topic. And the, the guys who wrote this book define moral grandstanding as, as essentially taking a moral position, taking a public moral position, really to self-promote in some way. So it's disingenuous. It's kind of like these studies where it's like a priori versus like, it's presented as a priori, but it's not. Yeah. So, so um, and much of that takes place on social media. In fact, lots of their examples of moral grandstanding mm-hmm. are from social media. So, so what, it's often hard to know, right? It, 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 we're not mind readers, so we don't really know mm-hmm. when an individual 
is doing something for self-promotion versus when they really believe the moral position they have. Like that's kind of hard to know. Um, and they acknowledge that. Uh, but they actually suggested this thought experiment where um, imagine what social media would be like if people only took moral positions that they really believed in. That's world one. And world two is where they have both positions they really believe in and they're doing it to like advance their own interests in some way. Mm -hmm. So obviously the, the, there might be issues in both worlds, but there certainly would be less grandstand. There would be less sort of histrionics, less bullying, less, you know, it would be less okay. toxic in that first world. I think everybody agrees with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was this book, but it's not my book. This is, you know, that, that's them. And there are people who study this sort of thing. I don't really study it, but I, I do think, I mean, part of what you asked me is do I apply this? And I think I do, so, or I try to. Because I regularly call out political biases in academia, and because those biases are almost always from the left, especially on Twitter, and to some extent even on my blog, I have a pretty substantial right-wing following. Yeah. And as it, with broad strokes, and it's not always true, but with broad strokes, much of the right is very, very suspicious of social science. And actually, I think they have good reasons to be suspicious of much social science. Such as what? But I say that publicly. So what that does is it allows me to bring certain ideas to people on the right that I think are pretty well founded that they perhaps might not otherwise listen to. Because I'm not a sort of, you know, crazy left wing ideologue. So, so in that sense, yes, I think I have created a certain amount of trust with a certain number of people on the right who actually are more willing to listen to social science that maybe doesn't always uh, validate right wing views. Mm -hmm. That is a fascinating um, kind of uh, secondary effect of being critical of your own side. I, I, I don't mean to accusing yeah. of being left but for me i'm probably left i don't know but i do spend a lot of time critiquing the left because the left annoys me more than the right frustrates me you know so <laughs> but what that ends up doing is giving me a lot of the attention of people on the right and then i get to start to have uh dialogues with the right that i wouldn't otherwise have and That's i can right. speak of the left, certain leftist positions, which would be probably a little bit more tolerant of certain things and venturing into certain discussions and then and then providing actually a more liberalization or a leftification of those <laughs> on the right, because I'm giving them ideas by like kind of like Trojan horsing them, not necessarily intentionally in right. this. Let's look at how crazy the left is thing. Right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's, to some extent, it's just establishing a certain level of trust and credibility, mm -hmm. which yeah. make a person, any person, left or right, more likely to listen to the argument. So, yeah. I, you know, the, 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 it, it, although I share a general, well, I, I think the social sciences would be well served by a, a, a huge dose, uh, by having to address the huge dose of skepticism that would come to them from the right. I, I, I completely, I intrinsically, genuinely believe that. Mm -hmm. That said, however, um, there are some findings and some principles and even kind of moral positions that, you know, by virtue of acknowledging that, kind of validating that, will just lead people on the right to be more open to the social science, mm -hmm. you know, so. Do you yeah. think that it, it, that you can also have the, the reverse effect of, of translating some of the right-ish ideas 
and make them more palpable to the left and like help them to like be more open to let, let's go the the height route of uh you know loyalty and tradition and <laughs> you know if if you if you truck with his ideas about moral so foundations. I, you know i can't tell the answer to that i don't know the in the wider society I would say I have run into more difficulty than success in trying to get people on the left to acknowledge the validity of anything on the right. So when I, this, I've had repeat versions of this experience that I'm about to describe just over and over again, where, let's say Trump or the Republicans will do something, no, that's not exactly right. Trump or the Republicans will do something that is incomprehensible to my friends and associates on the left. Like, they're just appalled and revolted. And... Because of social media, I am probably more exposed to how people on the right think about these things. Hmm. So when you listen, and when I say people on the right, again, I, I'm not interested in like, you know, white supremacists or the, you know, okay. the, the, the actual alt right or, you know, I'm talking about smart, thoughtful moderate Republicans, conservatives, you know, generally, I mean, in my circles, they're either going to be smart or intellectuals, right? These are people who can make a reasoned argument yeah. for their view, not sort of dogmatic, you know, sort of, you know, whatever, nutcase types. Okay. So early on, I would, what I found was I would try and present those views to my friends and on the left and they would just like i would start to get into fights with them because it's like no i'm not into it. so so what i learned to do then was say was preface and couch all of this mm. with you know walking through one of these cases you just said like you can't believe how anybody could possibly believe well how anybody could support kavanaugh that would be a concrete thing Okay, so if it was up to me, so I would start with something like this. I did not, I don't, did not think he should have been confirmed. I'm not justifying his confirmation. But you're, you raised the issue, you opened the door, you said, how could anybody believe this? So I'm now going to try to explain, not because I b believe or accept these arguments, although I think some of the arguments have some validity, even though I, at the end, I don't come down on that side. But if you want to understand how somebody could believe this, because I'm exposed to these, I actually think I have, you know, I can communicate why a reasonable, rational person would think that it was appropriate to, su to support Kavanaugh. With all that up front, they kind of often scrunch up their eyes, but they listen. Hmm. They, they, they don't just like bring out the hammer right away. And so you have, have to disarm the disagreement. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Before I even to, venturing into right, it. Right, that's right, that's right. Huh. Usually, almost always. There might be rare cases, but. But where I don't, but, but yeah. yeah. It, it, that makes me wonder if, if agreement as a litmus test for any sort of understanding is going to fail or at least lead into like hyper tribalism. Right. I mean, it's, it's, so one way to think about it is that tribalism trumps sort of reasoned discussion, right? So if you think, uh, you know, it, it, that I'm somehow threatening your sort of tribal identities, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I'm going to say. It's like, you know, you're going to hold the flag for your group. So, 
And I don't, I, I can't, getting around that is really, really hard. It's just really, really hard. Do you have any guesses into the historical um, the development of that entrenchedness in the left of that agreement or that tribalism? It seems like they were the party of tolerance, of understanding, of reaching out, of multiculturalism, of diversity. And now it's this monoversity, this university. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've recently seen that. That's a uh, that, that, that's a nice little play on words. So, um, I don't know. You, you know, the, the, there's tons of evidence that everything has gotten much more polarized than yeah. it was. So, you know, for for much of the last I don't know hundred years, there were liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats. They there were tons of swing con congressional districts that sometimes went this way, sometimes went that way. And then even if they weren't exactly swing districts, there were enough, you know, it was the, it was 60, 40 Democrat Republican. And, you know, if you were too far extreme, you would lose your own side. But hmm. not only have people, the parties become really ideologically polarized. So have people, and they've done so geographically as well. So over the last you know, 20, 30 years, people have moved into communities with others that are politically like them. Hmm. And so... It almost seems like, a, and this is totally shooting from the hip, it seems like a, a, like a, a growth out of like our understanding of branding and how branding or the commercialization of like identifying with a brand has kind of like become a core part of how we dwell with things, but it predates capitalism for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there may be some of that. I mean, there was some paper that I can't cite chapter and verse on now that basically identifies people's politics on the number of like a small number of things they own or do. And so the classic would be, you know, if you have a pickup truck, you're conservative. If you have a Prius, you're liberal, right? And there's a lot of truth to that, right? I mean, it's your branding thing, sort of identification with, I mean, the brands reflect people's values. Yeah. And, 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 values and brands are, are becoming aware of right? this. And you can yeah. see that in Nike and Gillette right. and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. That's right. Huh. Yeah. So, yeah, there is a lot there. Yeah, there's a lot of truth to that. What, what are some of like the, the burning questions in social psychology for you right now? Like the one that, that keeps you up at night or turn, uh, <laughs> gets you up in the morning, you know? Well, so the, the biggest is just getting the methods right to produce a more valid science. Like, cause that's, you know, that's the first step towards everything. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a, a lot of what I do. Um, however, hmm. I, and I, I mean, I see as part of that, the series of studies that we're doing on, uh, basically political bias in academia, you know, I mean, that's my narrow piece of that. So, yeah. you know, there are people working on doing better statistics and, you know, m uh, greater transparency and replication. Yeah. And I, I vow, that's all really important. I completely value that. But you can't do everything. My piece of it is on the political side. So we're doing a lot of that. We're also doing a number of replication studies. Especially, so one manifestation of political biases, in my opinion, and I think there's good evidence for this, is that work showing demographic biases, racial bias or social class bias or, or gender bias, is selectively highlighted in the literature. So the work on demographic biases becomes part of the canon if, if it shows bias. If it doesn't show bias, it's largely ignored. Which creates a really weird situation because it's not that you can't publish something showing lack of bias that stuff gets published it just gets published and mostly ignored so it's a very weird thing but anyway so we're doing 
hmm. replication studies of some of these earlier studies of bias as well. And we'll see. We, we will see what happens. They're in process. So That same exact thing um, happened at Evergreen. I, I have recording of a senior administrator uh, admitting that they selectively choose their data um, around race and kind of highlight the stuff that, you know, helps with their equity push and stuff. Um, so again, Evergreen's on the forefront of yeah, uh, yeah. the Academy, but, um, well, it just seems is... like that used to be a shame. It used to be a shame to cook the books. Maybe it never was, but it just seems like a malpractice in a way. It seems right. like it's absolutely, it is. It, I mean, it absolutely it is an it, it is social science malpractice as an a, analog to medical malpractice. The difference is people aren't dying, you know, they're not losing the wrong limb, you know, right? It, 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 in social science malpractice. But however, what you do get are completely ineffective and and sometimes, you know, the the negative side effects. I mean, if you have an ineffective intervention that has negative side effects, it's doing nothing but damage. Yeah. So, and I do think that's what some of what you get. And, and so what you're trying to do is bring in better methodology. And this is kind of a weird question. I don't know if you want to answer it is like using, like returning to like some sort of honor culture or like, like, like an attitude of facts matter. And like, I don't want to be wrong. So I'm going to submit myself to extreme uh, stress, ideological stress in order to like contribute to the truth. Um, and like some sort of attitude within these departments filled with squishy human beings um, that could have just as much a positive effect as the methodology. Well, so it, subtract out the, uh, the ideology, ideological part of everything you just said, okay. and that is the science reform movement. That, that is what they're trying to do. That they're trying to change the norms, raise the value of skepticism, um, mm. and... And, and thereby improve the ultimate quality of the social science. The problem with the ideological component is even the science reform movement is overwhelmingly people on the left. So, and there's good evidence on this. It, there, there are a slew of studies on political stereotyping, how people view you know, member, Democrats or Republicans, conservatives or liberals, pro-life, pro-choice advocates. And there's a slew of studies on this. And they consist that this is one of the, you know, talk about the uncertainty of prior social science. This is one of the things I would totally hang my hat on. You're right, if you had a gun to my head and you said, you know, is this true? I would say, yeah, this is true. And I would not worry about living to see the next next morning. And that is that that partisans exaggerate their opponents' views. So, yeah. and this is symmetrical, you know, uh, but the part that's most relevant for academia is that liberals see conservatives as way more extreme, dogmatic, intolerant than they really are. Mm -hmm. But I'm a psychologist. That is how they see conservatives. So the last thing even science reformers are going to want is to allow these dogmatic, intolerant, sort of dangerous people into the mm -hmm. academy. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the well, science goes, reform goes back, isn't, yeah. That goes back to one of the main, uh, strongest criticisms I've seen of the Heterodox Academy is by the independent Whig on, on Twitter. I've, I've interviewed him about a year ago. Um, and he says that the Heterodox Academy is built out of academics so it's our, it's not heterodox because you guys are a bunch of liberals. I like look at your videos, look at the lectures, um, look at how you guys are self-selecting already. So like, how can you have an academically sound group that's not built out of academics? Like, how can you select? How can you out-select your bias like without somehow seeding uh, something? Like, it seems like you've self-selected in your media presence people who don't get bored with you. So they they <laughs> they right. have right. to have like a tolerance for a certain <laughs> level of intellectualism or whatever. Like like you're you're talking about yes. like just kind of dry things. Um yes. 
So even if they are conservative, they're they're more intellectually inclined. So how do you how do they reach out? How does the the academy reach out to the intellectual right? You know, and read and maybe go to the think tanks, go to like their worst enemies, go to the people that coach the co coach cool. brothers here. No, that, yes, everything you just said is exactly right. I. I agree with most of Wig's criticism of Heterodox Academy. To some extent, it's the nature of the beast, right? Heterodox mm. Academy is of and for the Academy, which is overwhelmingly left. So the, the mission of Heterodox is to increase intellectual diversity, right? Now, how do you, now that it, in one way in which I might differ a little bit from the Wig on this, is its membership is more politically diverse than the rest of the, the academy. So Heterodox has done a much better job than the rest mm -hmm. of the academy of capturing that. Nonetheless, you know, the the, the most trenchant part of it, it wasn't just um, hmm. uh, Whig. You know, Heterodox had its first conference last summer. I wasn't there because I was out of the country. Uh, but nearly all of their speakers were on the left. And that was one target of just, in my opinion, justified criticism. But academia knows how to do this, right? If, mm. if you have a historically marginalized or excluded group, you reach out. You essentially engage in, mm. you know, it, it, there's like, this is so funny. If you read the academic scholarship on affirmative action, academics routinely deny that affirmative action is preferential selection. And there's some truth to that because there's lots of forms of affirmative action that are not preferential selection. There are mentoring programs and outreach programs and, uh, you know, removing obstacles. There's lots of forms of mm -hmm. taking proactive steps to remove obstacles or limit discrimination. There's lots of things that could and reasonably fall under affirmative action. More some, opportunity than outcome oriented. That, that's right. That's why well, mentoring, which is not, I don't know if it's an opportunity or not, but, okay. but whatever. There are lots of things that are not preferential selection. But, if, but without all that preface, if I simply said to you affirmative action for conservatives, what most of the audience would hear is preferential selection. <laughs> that's what they would hear. Because this goes back right to the sort of set, right? You, you, you want to cast your opponents in the worst possible light. So Even if you don't want to. Yeah, I think it's just it's it's whether it's motivated or not doesn't really matter. I, and I don't you know, maybe sometimes it is sometimes it isn't. I, I think it's probably implicit a lot. And I think it's just this is how you see things and stuff. So um, I, it's funny that you brought that up because Heterodox is planning its second conference for this summer. And you know the the head is now Deborah Mashek. I mean, height is still heavily involved, but it, but the the official head is Deborah Mashek. And so I pinged her and said, you know, you really need to um, do something like have a, a whole morning devoted to conservative academics. And the and I gave her a list of like eight or ten people who I thought could be appropriate. Not that you would have all of them, but you'd have some of them. Um, and to me, that would be an instantiation of sort of outreach to conservative ideas. Mm -hmm. It's not so much the people. It's the ideas. You want them Mm -hmm. You want the ideas represented at such a conference. Yeah. And she painted me back and said, well, that's not how we're going to do it. We're going to try and do it in other ways. Blah, 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 blah. So, but, but, you know, your question to me was, how do you do that? And, and my answer is, academia knows how to do this. Hmm. They've been arguing for this forever. This needs to do it with, uh, with, with politics as well as everything else. Well, at the same time, as, uh, I, I just hear the, the voices in the comments saying, uh, yeah, an academic says, oh, trust the academy. We know how to do this. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, those voices, they would also be right. I mean, they, yeah, exactly. I mean, because we opened up talking about the diversity statements, which are another right. way of selecting for an even Absolutely. stronger leftist, can you put right. up with this stuff right. and not think of it as bullshit? And right. then who can get through these social sciences without completely losing their, their conservative bias, you know? Absolutely. Like it's self-selecting. So I, I just I just wonder if if the online world or if like this alternative academy um, needs to come about in order to foster and accredit uh, non hyper liberal uh, ways of thought, and if that's possible. Well, I'm mean, just descriptively, some of that's already happening. I mean, you have a lot of these independent think tanks that have risen up on the on the right or on libertarian, you know, yeah, sort of conservative or libertarian think tanks that are 
sort of intellectual and even social science but not part of the academy in a traditional sense. They're not, they're not directly affiliated with any particular university or college. So you do have that, and I think that's really unfortunate. I mean, that just huh. that, 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 that polarizes the research in a way that – that it may be better than the alternative of not having these independent right-leaning institutions, but it just, I, I, the university, the university system and the social sciences would be better if, you know, especially the social sciences, if 20, 30% of the faculty were right or right-leaning. Yeah. And, Just um, because we were, then we could then have conversations with it. We, we, we would be compelled to deal with each other. Yeah. Right now, the overwhelmingly left-wing social sciences are not compelled to deal with serious thinkers on the right. Yeah, and it makes it even easier for them to uh, demand uh, prior to understanding that agreement happens. Like you were saying about like having to do all these caveats where I am not a conservative. I am not a conservative. <laughs> But let's let's think about the conservatives. If if they were actually had to meet each other in the corridors, that's right. They wouldn't require that. Th that's right. That's uh -huh. exactly right. Well, yeah. cool, Lee. Thanks so much for your time. I should let you get going. And uh, I don't know. Do you pour your thoughts into students, or are you just a research kind of guy? Are you? Do you actively uh, profess? <laughs> well, I'm currently chair of my department. So I'm not actually teaching right now. Oh, cool. Uh, but but. The actually the last time I taught undergrads, um, well, uh, uh, well, a large last time I taught a large introductory social psych class was spring 2018. So it's not that long ago. Oh, okay. And um, I had thoroughly revamped that class because of both the political issues and the science reform issues. So there's a lot of social psychology I no longer believe. Hmm. And in order to get at what is credible within social psychology, in my opinion, we needed to do two things first. Uh, we needed to discuss the intellectual roots of political support for speech and academic freedom, because without those, you can't have inquiry on controversial topics, which social psychology deals with all the time. So I spent kind of a, more time than you might expect in a social psychology course on that. And then I also spent a fair amount of time on, on science reform and the, the great messages of the science reform movement, which is hmm. that most of how we went about doing business for much of the existence of social psychology did not produce a sound literature. So, Which is not saying it's all false. It's just saying we don't. It's hard to know what's true and what's false from the older literatures. Yeah, it seems like a, a kind of a return to first principles. Then, a absolutely, uh, that is how I saw the course, yeah. and, and then maybe half the course was on what I saw as some of the sounder. Sometimes I taught contro the controversy. So there, there are controversial things in such as the validity and importance of implicit biases. So I taught that as a controversy. And then there are some things that I think are on really sound footing and I taught those as well. But it, the course was 40% preliminaries, 40% mm. first, first principles, so, which meant there was less social psychology than at any time prior to oh, me. Oh, interesting. Huh. And what was your read on the room of where the students were at, at this kind of thinking and, and questioning these? Yeah, it, 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 it worked from my standpoint. So, um, you didn't get protested? I did not get protesting. In fact, my political high point was I... The Rutgers Graduate Student Association had recently rejected even a consideration of endorsing the University of Chicago statement on free speech and academic freedom. So the University of Chicago has this very strong, you know, pub policy about, you know, pretty much anything goes. And, and if you don't like it, don't, don't go here. It's more articulate than that, but that's the upshot. Um, and the Rutgers grad students, you know, wouldn't even debate it. Like it never got, you know, hmm. and, and based on, so one of my grad student advisees was a, a student, grad student senator or whatever was on the governing board for psychology. And so he would try to lobby for this and were, as, as he tells it, 
was basically told that, well, you know, this is just dumb because everybody knows free speech is just a mask for racism and all this kind of stuff. So that's why it never went anywhere. Mm-hmm. So I actually brought him into my class where he presented and, I, you know, we worked at this. So he, I think he did a, a good job of presenting the arguments for and against endorsing the Chicago principles. And then the class divided into small groups. You know, the class had maybe 100 students in it, so these were groups of like two or three or four to discuss these two sides. And they were able to, you know, they could bring in anything else that they wanted. And they were, their goal was to attempt to bring, to reach a consensus in their small group as to whether they had three options, reject the Chicago principles, accept them, or accept them with revisions. Okay. So uh, and what I envisioned was maybe like a prohibition against hate speech. Like I didn't say that, but that's what I kind of expected to come out. So they deliberate. And then at the end of those deliberations, we have a discussion in class as to you know, what, what each group chose and why. The class, so they're voting by group now. They're not voting by, hmm. you know. So every group reached consensus. And it was about 50-50, half said, support the Chicago principles and half said support it with revisions. And so then we talked about that. They came explained why and the, actually the first person to speak and this is going to be relevant given all the racism stuff was a young black woman. And she gets up and she says, "Well, we endorse the Chicago, the principles because you know, it means both a racist can speak and somebody who wants to oppose the racist can speak." And so uh, you know, this is like the best of all possible worlds or something like that. And it was like, oh, my God, this kid got it. He was yeah. like, great. So but but the half that proposed revisions, the nature of the revisions they proposed were always different, but they always involved giving the principles more teeth. Like, well, you know, it's OK to have the principle, but what if somebody violates it? What are we going to do about that? You know, they need to be punished in some way. And it was like, okay. <laughs> it was like halfway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, how uh, that pendulum swings. <laughs> I know, right? It was really, it was amazing. It was a completely amazing experience. Wow. So. Yeah. You know what? I, I, I really feel that uh, 2016 through probably 2015 to, to 17, starting with um, the Christakis incident right. in, in the courtyard and probably ending with the Evergreen um, situation. And then uh, stuff happened a year after that, but this year it's been pretty quiet. And yeah, I think all the exposure um, caused the kids to say, those guys look like idiots. We don't want to <laughs> look like idiots. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe. I, and, I, I, and I think I, that has... that um, with one of my good friends that still works at Evergreen College, he, he did a course that was just like, we're going to debate ideas. We're going to go through and we're going to debate co- uh, controversial ideas. And I think that that professors are getting smarter and started starting to design courses around first principles rather yeah. than jumping the the hoop and going right to like this is what the world is that's my yeah, feeling that's do, do yeah you that'd be agree with that? I, I don't it's certainly true that things have gotten quieter i would say i personally don't fully understand what's going on i think it's the fairest goddamn skeptic hum, hum, <laughs> humble guy i don't want to leave on a softy note <laughs> yeah that's about right <laughs> that's the, you know once you embrace uncertainty in that way you know which is I, I think alice drager has a i think it was in inside higher ed or the chronicle of higher education you know a long form essay where she says the the motto of science should be we are uncertain I think she just nails it. Just completely nails it. Well, that makes sense that you guys are like uh, getting you guys to come to a consensus is like herding a bunch of Schrodinger cats. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. And, and, you know, to my field's credit, as much as I criticize mm. social psychology and psychology, it is moving in that direction in recognizing that. And I think that's great. I never thought I would see that development. So I'm like completely psyched that that's happening. Hmm. Awesome. Rousing. <laughs> all right all right lee thanks so much man yeah yeah this was good L- let me know when this is uh posted or whatever i will know. i will you're like lightning in a cubicle <laughs> 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 yeah
Yeah, I guess that probably is me. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right, Kevin. I'll talk Take to you care. soon. Bye. Ciao.